Australian government implementing these discriminatory laws to the Israeli occupation forces carrying out their dirty work to the settlers stealing people's homes that Pal Palestinians are not important and are not human beings in the same way that Westerners are human beings. We were forced across the road from the house and just an hour later watched as American citizens and British citizens moved into our home. I saw Jenna who called me just a few hours before to say that she would like to make me a birthday cake. Now completely distraught with tears pouring from her eyes and she said this is the second time I've been evicted from my home so how can I ever forget and I remember seeing Maha the father of the family talking to the one or two reporters who'd managed to sneak past the police blockades and I'd seen him tell the story of their family's plight maybe a thousand times before without a problem. But this time he broke down halfway through and he couldn't even finish his words. And that hurt me more than anything. I stayed with the family for the next few weeks, now sleeping on the pavement opposite their home and we watched as the settlers walked in and out laughing and high-fiving with the soldiers sitting on the steps that we used to sit on to pass the time and playing football in the street where we used to play but like I got a call from a friend of mine in Belai, a small Palestinian village, in to tell me that at the same time as we were being evicted, the village and arrested seven people. So I went back, but little did I know at the time that Belai would become my home six months. Can you start the photos, please? Of course, Belaim isn't just any ordinary village. It's situated right in the apartheid wall that Israel has built, which has stolen over half their land. Belaim is a traditional farming village. So many farmers lost everything they ever had when the war began. The people of Belaim have marched there to non-violently protest against the theft of their land together with Israeli activists and supporters from around the world to chant and to wave banners and to demonstrate their disgust at Israel's policies in a peaceful manner. So for six months, I marched with them. And every week, without fail, we were met with the force of the Israeli army. Clouds of tear gas, deafening sound grenades, rubber-coated steel bullets, and even live ammunition. Now in response, to the non-violent demonstration, the Israeli army launched a campaign of intimidation and harassment against the people of Belayim. For four months straight, they in jail 
for months on end, purely for the fact that they dared to participate in the demonstrations. Now, when I first arrived in the village, these were just any young guys being arrested. But as one month, two months passed, it became my close friends and people I was hanging out with in the day being taken from us at night. And the invasions were not only limited to night. Some houses to the wall. And he said to her, if these demonstrations don't stop, we're going to come back to your house. So it's a one any sleep around there. But more than this, I want to tell you about the people I met in Belayin, the people that didn't become like my family, that are my family. The first person I ever met in the village was a guy called Kaiser. He was working as a filmmaker and came out every night to document the night raids and of course, every Friday to film the demonstration. Now, since the nonviolent resistance had begun, Haifam had lost his regular job as an electrician and therefore his form of income. And I remember once asking him why he sacrificed so much time. When he was 15 years old, alone as he felt when he was arrested as a young boy. Now, Haitham's youngest child is a two year old boy, and when he was just a few months old, he was diagnosed with leukemia. Now, before the resistance began, Haitham would take his son to the hospital in Jerusalem every day to get treated. But since Haitham began filming the night raids and the demonstrations, the Israeli army have refused to leave his permit to travel to Jerusalem. So as a punishment for daring to play a role in a non-violent resistance movement, Haitham is not allowed to take his small son to the hospital in Jerusalem to get the treatment he needs to live. I was living with a young guy called Hamdi. He's 22 years old, working as a photographer and has all the same ambition as me or you. But the only difference is that Andy is facing the reality of being trapped under a military occupation. Every night we would sit up in his room together, listening to music and waiting for news of another invasion, wondering which one of our friends would be arrested next. But I can't count Handy as a friend of mine because six months is far too long for that. So he's my brother and he always will be. Now Handy's oldest brother is a guy called Hamid. During one of the Friday demonstrations, Hamid was standing with his arms in the air when he was shot in the head by an Israeli soldier standing around 20 meters away with a high velocity tear gas canister. He was in a coma for two weeks and stayed in the hospital for several months after that. And he still suffers from his injuries today. And you could tell because all his brothers were very jokey people whereas Hamid was much more serious and would get angry easily over small things. But nevertheless, we became very close and I remember once talking to Hamid about a week before I was due to leave Belayin 
and he said, Jody, I don't want you to leave because it will be like Basim. And he was talking about his cousin, Basim Abrahma, who was killed during one of the demonstrations in April of last year. Now, at the time he was killed, Basim, one of the most active members of the community, was standing at the very front of the demonstration.